Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Tempe City Council and Tempe Coalition for Affordable Housing Board, otherwise known as the affiliate uh, for this joint meeting. I uh, tell people too, you can visit tempe.gov, council slash council meeting info for public viewing and attendance information. Uh, members of the public may attend the meeting virtually through Microsoft Teams as well. Just a note to everyone in the room, uh, there were, last time there was a meeting held in this room, like last week, there were some audio issues. It could be very difficult to hear with that only that one speaker in the center of the table. So if you are speaking, I would ask that you do speak like this and project so people at home can hear uh, and, and no one from the public has to contact us later. Jared is currently checking to make sure that it's positioned just perfectly to capture all voices. Um, so with that said, um, I guess we can probably go ahead and go to item number two here, which is welcome and introduction. I think if I start hammer with you and we sort of circle around. Yeah, Clark. Jared Weiss, Tim Yankee, uh, Tim Burst, Director of Community Health and Services. Good afternoon and welcome, Rosie and Chasti, Interim City Manager. Good afternoon, Ken McCoy, Chief. Hello, everyone, Arn Lange. Doreen Garland, Council Member. Corey Woods, Mayor. Bernetta Hush, Council Member. Bill Navarro, Council Member. Jack Drummond. Elliot, I'm Tavia Harris. I'm board of directors for the affiliate. Angela Laws, board of directors for the affiliate. Lisa Carmichael, CPA and CFO for the affiliate. Owen B. Kane, um, deputy director of community health and human services, as well as the affiliate president and managing member. <laughs> Good afternoon, Wydell Holmes, director of innovation and strategic management. Excellent. All right, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. I'm going to move forward here to item number three, which is Tempe Coalition for Affordable Housing Organizational Updates. And I will turn it over to Irma. Thank you, Mayor Woods, uh, council, council members, board of directors. Um, welcome today, and thank you for your time and your talent um, that you're bringing to the table today. I just wanted to make a couple of announcements about the Tempe Coalition for Affordable Housing um, organization uh, update, if you, if you will. So. Um, seated, seated next to me on the right is Teresa Carmichael. She is the affiliate's new CFO, so we're really um, happy to have her on board. And if you don't mind, Teresa, just give me a little bit more. Okay. Um, I'm the principal in a CPA firm that's located in Mesa. We've been there for 30 years. We have a large uh, population of nonprofit clients, which brought me in, in connection with the coalition, uh, I serve Arizona NARA, housing and redevelopment officials. Have some small locals like the Mesa Chamber, a client, uh, nationals, the American Association of Men in Nursing. So they have a wide spectrum of nonprofits we serve. Um, I've sat in a board position on a couple of nonprofits, if you're familiar with. Our community resources, now known as public, on that board, uh, president, and served on the board of the Mesa Association. So I understand that close relationship that some nonprofits have with government. Uh, currently serving on a new lead audit. A little bit of good, solid nonprofit. Really quickly, I, I forgot to do this as well. I didn't go to people on the phone for introductions. Uh, I can see, uh, Christy, can you go ahead and introduce yourself? And, and can you also tell me uh, how the sound is from where you are? Good afternoon, Mayor and Councilman and everyone in the room. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. I can hear you. You cut out just a little bit here and there. Um, and like you said, Mayor, if they could project a little bit, I think we might be able to hear a little bit better as well. But my name is Christy Alvarado. I'm with MEB Affordable Management Services, and we manage 52 properties for the Tempe Coalition for Affordable Housing. We started May 1st with Irma, and we're super excited about this business relationship and working with her on affordable housing. Thank you, Christy. Really appreciate it. Let me also uh, just really quickly next go to our uh, city attorney, Sonia Blaine, if you want to introduce yourself. Or we can just come back. 
We know she's there, which is one of what people know we have legal representation in the house. So um Mayor Woods, also Captain Chang is on our board and um in the team's meeting. Okay. Uh Kathy, can you uh, uh come off mute and introduce yourself to the group as well? <clears throat> Hi, this is Kathy Chang. Irma just introduced me. <laughs> so happy to serve on the board and happy to be here. Thank you. Just so just to know whatever for all those watching at home, uh, Vice Mayor Adams is on the phone. Uh, Council Member Keating could not attend this evening as he's out of the country. So I with that, I will turn it back over to Council Member Hodge. Okay, my question was about the HOA fees. I was just wondering, I thought that about the depreciation it seems i don't know anything about those things but it seems like that's a very large number for very few years of accumulating property we're writing off the uh, uh, appreciation on the buildings and cells yes. and the land's holding value or increasing yes generally typically we use 20 percent um salvage or land value we assign 20 percent 80 percent and depreciate the 80 percent with residential properties and 27 and a half year life and a straight line purpose yeah it's 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 definitely in commercial if you're used to that is 39 years so it's a little longer than residential and that's that, that to me seemingly large numbers due to the we have 54 properties correct so even small amounts of depreciation Yes, um, and uh, Teresa, do you mind sharing your big lift, your big accomplishment? Oh, yeah. So um, one of the things we noted when we first came on board was that there were property tax expenses. You, the, the affiliate was paying real estate taxes. And I um, knew from prior experience with clients that we should be tax exempt. Now, as municipalities having owned the properties prior to deeding them over to the affiliate, there was no property tax. But the moment they were deeded over to the nonprofit, the county kicks in and charges real estate tax. So that was one of my first questions is why aren't we tax exempt? So we did, in fact, apply during the application period in January, and we were approved for an organizational exemption. Um, so we're very excited about that. Oh, That's yeah, yeah. Nice. thousands of dollars, yeah, thousands sure. of dollars, literally. Um, the other great news I received just before I left for this meeting, we had called the county because in uh, a prior situations, slightly similar on another nonprofit, they missed applying. This is an annual exemption. Every year you must apply for it. They missed applying and their tax bill was $22,000 for their property. And we found a, a way to get retroactively moved. So we called the county last week and asked if there was any uh, potential relief for us for prior years. And we talked through the process and we will move forward. We think we will have relief for those property taxes prior to our exemption. So for 22 and possibly 21 as well. So we're going to work on that. So, Teresa, do you have an estimated amount of, of dollars that are diverted back into the affiliate not having to be paid in property tax? Um, I wish I did. We haven't had enough time to explore. We know for a fact that we're in arrearage right now of approximately 10000 So that's 10000 that I do not expect we'll pay. We have paid in the past, uh, the past two years 35000 and my hope is that we can recoup that as well. Uh, but to give you an accurate annual, I would be taking a stab. Thank you. Sounds good. Anything else on item number 4A? Okay. <clears throat> Seeing none, thank you so much. That will take us to item number 5, 
City of Tempe Affordable Housing Asset Map Preview. And I will turn this over to Wydell. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Board and Council. I'm Wydell Holmes, Director of the Management Innovation Office. And first of all, at the last joint meeting, you asked for data. And that warms our hearts as we are a data-driven uh, community um, uh, alongside our, our stakeholders. And so today I'd like to share with you eight maps that we'd like to preview with you. And um, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge and thank Dr. Stephanie Dietrich. She's from our IT. She manages our IT and GIS team. And she is the brilliance behind these images that you're going to see today. And we're very open to your feedback and questions that we can answer today. And if not, we'll follow up with you on, on some that we may not have answers for. So this first uh, map here is in regards to the coalition's housing portfolio. So these are board members. These are your assets. There's about 61 uh, rental units. And you can see that the legend down in the middle the middle of the slide there will show you the concentration in these hexagon, hexagon areas. Um, we have purposely uh, not pinpointed the exact addresses of, out of privacy uh, for, our, uh, for our tenants, but wanted to give you the general idea of where these are in relationship to across the city. You can see that most of these are above US 60. And so that was one of the questions that we uh, chatted about at our last meeting in regards to where are the coalition's assets. So this is one example um, of one of the maps I'd like to share with you. The next map is in regards to market rate properties that have affordable housing units. And we, we use the term time bound. So these are private developments of about 75 properties. And these properties are, they basically have a, a clock on them. So one of them ranges from the, the one in the top left hand corner, that is the 20 to 37 units. That is about 17 years to remain in affordable housing status. And the other one is about 30 years. And so this is another strategy that our community has in regards to working with private development um, to make sure that we are all doing our part in regards to affordable housing. And you'll see that most of those assets, or all of those assets right now um, for these uh, private developments with a time bound units are above US 60, north of US 60. And then our, our next map is about our housing choice voucher program. So Irma and her team, they work with federal government about um, $13 million in housing subsidies each year, and they have uh, over 1,200 units. And majority of the vouchers are utilized north of US 60. Um, and you can realize that when Irma mentioned at our last meeting, she does have some landlord strategies that her team is putting into place so that we can start utilizing vouchers also south of US 60. So this just gives you an idea of, again, uh, denoted for privacy, kind of the concentration of where a lot of these units um, lie here in the city. And then hometown for all land locations. This is land that was purchased by the city or transferred from the city for development. And these would be transferred to a nonprofit, which the affiliate is one of the nonprofits that this land would be transferred to. And so you can see we have about five um, areas, parcels right now that are, um, that are in this category with uh, three of them already being purchased and one of the parcels being already transferred for, for units for affordable units. And then on the next slide, what's interesting about what Dr. Dietrich has done with the gallery, when we give you the active link, when we've kind of gone through some of our QAQC, you'll be able to see some other maps that, for example, this one, this is the percent of affordable rentals. And you'll be able to see a difference between what happened in 2020 on your left to where we are at as of last year, 2022. Overall, the rent um, in 2022 is more affordable, the deeper the purple, uh, more affordable north of US 60, and then therefore consequently less affordable south of US 60. Um, the most significant increase of rent has been on the west side of Tempe. As you can see, we've kind of had some lighter parcels turn a little bit darker there. So um, the other thing too, is you'll see in the right hand southeast corner, if you look at Corona Village down in the bottom there, all the way to the right, those that area has become less affordable in regards to uh, rental, rental uh, affordability. So the next map again, another 
bit of a contrast between 2020 and 2022 is the median gross rent. And the farther south you go in Tempe, we will find higher pockets of rent, um, especially in the most south southern part of Tempe. You'll see a little bit towards the southeast corner of Tempe as well and alongside that 101 corridor. That's okay. That's right. When you, uh, the gross, is this like 1,750, 1, is that per one bedroom or is that? It's by unit. I don't have the bedroom, numbers of bedrooms available okay. for this one. Would that be helpful? If yeah, because it makes a difference. That. Yeah, because it makes a little bit of difference if it's mm -hmm. one bedroom affordable versus or, five or, bedrooms. <laughs> or five bedrooms affordable. So I wanted right. to. I think it's just the uh, unit. The, uh, the, the home or the unit itself yeah. in regards to that's a great question person. and you know because we report in this data is derived directly from the 22 matrix of uh, uh, affordability and inventory analysis and that being said we were reporting everything based on a family of four median family income so i'm wondering if this is at least a two bedroom but we would need to clarify that for right. you okay Thank you. great Hodge. question thank you so on the next slide here we have our median home values and you can see from 2020 to 2022 our matrix report reported reported that our sale prices increased by 38 percent overall in tempe so median home value is highest in south tempe and lowest in the northeast part of tempe and obviously with north of us 60 is the highest it's directly the highest rent in regards to asu is the gray Right there where it says Tempe, you can see a little gray parcel, north, north, south, and then um, west as we have higher rents there in relationship to ASC. The highest being in the 400,000 category. And then similarly, we have two years of home ownership rate. And on this particular map, um, most prevalent south of the US 60, where um, rates are home ownership is more prevalent um, than in North Tempe. I, I don't think any of that surprises this group here today. So I know um, Dr. Dietrich is on the line too. So if you have any questions or comments, we'd be happy to hear about this gallery. Um, we're in development still. Um, we'll be, this will all, these galleries, this gallery will be public facing when we go live. Um, I know that there was another map that we are still working on in regards to city owned parcels and that probably will not be a public map in regards to kind of having strategic strategic uh, discussions um, with this group and with the city council. So um, with that, um, any questions or comments about the map gallery? Sounds good. Thank you. What else? Any questions from anyone? Questions, comments? Yeah, I had one trying to find what slide it was. <laughs> Um, there's a slide that shows the properties that we own. Um, the hotel hotel for all. Okay. Yeah, so on that on that slide, at one of our council meetings, we directed like $2.7 million for three properties that the city of Tempe owned to make those properties shovel ready so we could eventually do um, build our own affordable housing that we could take care of. Are these the three locations? Because I know they weren't. I'm just curious. I, I, I was where those properties are. Council. To be part of that. No, no, no. no. So three I believe small. it's at all the ones that are located around the Apache Central Center, the old city. The city the and Dorsey no, and Lemon. <coughs> they were smaller properties. You're talking about like it, uh, I, we can talk about offline. I don't want to take up the time, but it, no. it was something different. It was a small, I mean, they were small properties. There were three of them. We wanted to make them shovel ready, so we approved money to do it but i don't it's not it's not the um the food city that has the three properties there it wasn't yeah. that one or it wasn't this body the, 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 the one I, I remember just vaguely was about we spent it was either like 1.2 or 1.3 million to do the remediation on five city-owned lots i mean that might be no what idea, no but i don't remember exactly where the lots were i just know we were trying to get five city-owned lots shovel ready for development Amir, what's coming to mind is, you know, the COFA and Newtown are getting ready to put the shovel in the ground. So I'm wondering if that prep work <coughs> might have been at those particular projects. It's not, it's not those. Yeah. 
Okay. We'll, we'll look at we'll look at five. I'm taking ten bucks. Just curious if that's not it. We'll... If there's more money for development, more <laughs> <laughs> land. Let's do it. <laughs> Just saying. And based on what Jeff said, we're saying and based on what the discovery is for those, we'll try to see what the most appropriate map would be um, for those properties. If it's not this, if it's more um, of a different map, mm -hmm. so we'll work with Irma and her team to figure okay. to figure that out. Okay, great. Board Member Drummond. Um, yeah, on the market rate properties, affordable time bound. Yes, sir. Um, this is like rent control. What is it that we're enticing them to do to not change their rents for decades? They're already getting a really healthy tax break on the property. Or what's the That's a better question for Irma. Okay. <laughs> Director Drummond. Um, how I would answer that is uh, this is all negotiated in what would be called a development agreement with the city. And so, uh, so for example, a developer uh, says, I I'd like to build 100 units. I'll set 60 of them aside um, for workforce housing. And so with that said, what, how will you help me out in this development? We might, we might, you know, there might be a gif lit. There might, is there somebody that can help me say this? I, 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 I can give an example. Thank I mean, you. so one that I was thinking of was the uh, Wexford Developments property at First and mm -hmm. Farmer, where, um, where they agreed to build 200 units. So 180 of the units were going to be market rate, but then 20 of the units were going to be affordable for a 30 year time period. <coughs> and the council granted them a giplet rate in order to make that happen. But we did it in exchange for the 30 year affordability on those 20 units. So basically 10% of the entire development. You're welcome. Anyone else? Comments, questions? Yes. So what is the plan? I mean, now that we have this information, I don't know. Uh, what, what, what is that, I guess, our next step? And maybe that's what our... Uh, um, well, Director Mandela, if... There's probably a couple of different tracks all happening at the same time. So there's the work that we're doing here at the city, mm -hmm. and then there's the work that us as a board of the Tempe Coalition for Affordable Housing needs to take on identifying what our long-term strategies are in fulfilling what the city needs of us. And so that work is ours to do as yeah, a board. That's what I was thinking. Maybe I was just thinking about like. We could maybe get together, absolutely think about how we could further. Now that we have this great information, you know what we can do in the future to kind of further the goals that are in this document. Absolutely, absolutely. Councilor Brewer. Yeah. So with all this information, <coughs> I think it's <coughs> is, is it giving us a flavor of what Tempe is doing to affect affordability, and then are we doing above our share? Are we do, do we need to do more or less? You know what I'm saying? Compared to the region and um, what other cities are, or maybe land size, what other cities are doing. What I'm trying to get to is I don't want to be the, the, the front runner because we're doing all affordable, the whole city is affordable. Are we doing a, a good enough job to have affordability throughout Tempe? And are we doing our share? Does this, how do we relate this information with what the other regions or the other cities are doing and is there information that we can get on that because here's the thing we, we constantly get from our community we're not doing enough not doing enough I, I i feel that we are doing a lot i don't know how where we're at but i don't want to um when i look at some of those maps i'm inundating a lot of apache with affordability and i thought the goal of the city was to diversify and not to have clusters or start putting things in one area to make it affordable. <clears throat> so I like what we're doing, I like the map, but how does this relate to other cities and where, where are we at in the market? Are we above the market? Are we in the middle, below, those kind of things? Can we get that information? I think that's valuable information when we talk and tell about our story on what we're doing as a community. Thank you, Councilmember. So, but going back to the 22 matrix report, the inventory and affordability analysis, that really kind of puts, um, gives us context as to where we land, 
Well, first of all, this provides us <coughs> information about where we are. Right. And once we know where we are, then we can determine where we want to go. So when we when we look at maps like that and we see that below the 60, there's very little affordability going on, we can start making decisions about do we want to enter that space. Um, with regard to the affordability and inventory analysis, it does give us context of who we are in this compared to peer cities who also have universities and similar uh, demographics that we enjoy here in the city of Tempe. So we do have that that information as well. As it pertains to the rest of the region, I think that um, because the city of Tempe is so far ahead than our sister cities here in the America for Regional area, um, in knowing where we're at and also having defined where we want to go, it may be a little difficult to identify where we are in, re in relation to them because I don't know that we have the data to to make those types of comparisons. But I can tell you this with regard to hyper-focus on uh, affordability. We seem to be, because that's the context of, you know, the mission of the affiliate and what the board expects of the affiliate right. to the work that we're to, to get done. And really relying on the market to create the space for market rate and luxury so that we're not so out of whack and only doing affordable. The market is taking care of all the other housing types. Right, right. And I think I'd love to get to the story. And I don't know how hard this is with the other cities of just, can I share, can you share data with us? So we can get an idea of what we're doing within Tempe and what the communities around us are doing. I think that story has to be shown. I'm not saying that we're not we're still going to do affordability. We, there's still need, you know what I'm saying, in various areas. I think that we can probably stretch out in South Tempe. I know that I've talked to developers that want to do affordability, especially in the um, in, in areas of South Tempe that are just dirt right now, and they have an opportunity to do something. That That's some strategic, strategic help that we need to get into, and they need, we need to help them. But I think it helps provide those pockets and I look at it too as families can live in those areas and enjoy those schools and enjoy those surroundings and get a you know head start and all those stuff and it's connected to the buses and things like that. But at the same time too, I want to make sure that when we go when we have these conversations, but especially out in the community, it's like, no, we are doing our share in Tempe. And here's the region, and here's where we lie, and here's the bigger picture. Because the bigger picture is what everyone doesn't understand. And the other thing too is we talk about Tempe, 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 but I talk about five mile radiuses around the center of Tempe. If we talk about five mile radiuses around downtown, it's what's the affordability in that radius because all those things have connect connectivity, you know, to, I and mean, we live in a, you know, blended mm -hmm. cities. It's not just Tempe, it's the region. Mm -hmm. So that's where I'm kind of driving. I, I don't know if those conversations or calls to those cities can help out. Just like, hey, what are you guys doing? Can you share some information? Should, I, by means, I'm going to do that in MAC with, with the health and, health and safety committee that I'm on. I'm going to share this information to for other people, for other cities to join on to, utilize it. I think we could support um, Irma's team in regards to looking at either some other indicators of affordability that we can normalize across cities because we know our geography is different, our demographics are different. <coughs> but just to kind of give us an idea, I mean, I heard Tim say we heard kind of a little bit of a scorecard. But we can certainly work with our Valley Benchmark communities to try to see what would help us, you know, where do we stand is what I think you're asking in regards to the relationship of what other cities are doing as intentional and purposeful as Tempe. Okay. Council Number Two. Thank you, Mayor. Great questions, Council Member Navarro. I think for me, in hearing this, it provides um, an update to help inform decisions later. Right, as we're looking at transportation, as we're looking at <clears throat> equity, as we're looking at the time bound properties versus the projects that will be um, financed by Hometown for All. Right, what are temporary ones, 30 years temporary versus per permanent 100% affordable housing? I think it helps me in this role. To, to take that information into account as we're making other decisions also. I think also you mentioned it when you're at MAG, when we're with other cities, listen, 
listen and ask for those things and bring that information back. But I would rather staff sure if you hear it, but keep focusing on this and keep digging into this so that we know because we have our own goals about a balance of inventory of different types of housing and where are we on that i think this helps me better understand where we are in inventory and equity in terms of geography so great and and i think we keep asking those things and keep looking at it so. uh, Madam City Manager. just wanted to thank you for that question I think those are the questions we've been grappling with since 2016 when we asked Mayor Bloomberg to step in and ask us to kind of how do we set the goals? What do we look like? During that time, City of Tempe had over 50% of its housing stock was affordable. I think it was 54% wow. wow. before this last housing Jeez. inventory. 34% was workforce. I think 17% was luxury. They paused wow. when they saw that. And they said, if you can maintain this, you're going to surpass other cities. That was the narrative in 2016 or 17 when we met with them. Obviously, things have changed. The market has changed. But I do believe everyone's asking the right question. First, we start, we under, need to understand our climate. What do we look like right now? But it would help all of us to know where do we want to be. Yeah. And we know that ecosystem of housing stock, we pride ourselves on being diverse and having something for everyone. Um, that means to your to your question is does that mean 70 percent affordable and then that we don't invite working you know units or people that want uh, something different right um so i think we're asking i'm hearing all the right questions stephanie deep trick is online she texts and she says she's already mm -hmm. on the census trying to figure out what other cities the housing inventory looks like and that's open data sources so we will work on that and not to say, and I'm sorry, but not to say, I just came back from Troy, Illinois, and talking to firefighters out there, their city is medium to poor general, you know, in terms of housing stock. And you can see it, I mean, in those pockets, but, and it's got this ability to be more, but it's so down. And it's not to say the Tempe, it would ever be that way or, or anything like that, but it, it just kind of says, we have this great balance. I don't want to be overbalanced, but I want to be balanced, you know, in the percentages that make sense. And that's all. Councilmember Hodge, then Vice Mayor Adams. My, my question, I guess I'm going to go outside of the city and outside of the state. I would like, can we have like a comparison to like the some, certain cities that fit our standards within the nation and see how we are actually doing? Because Going against Mesa or, or Scottsdale is not really giving me an ideal, but I would like to see a city that has about the same population, the same size, and where are we at in that standards too? I know that's a lot to ask questions. Actually, what Rosa mentioned earlier, when we worked with um, Harvard Bloomberg, we <coughs> identified about six cities that we were similar to nationally. Yeah, Probably that's what I'm looking at. Yeah. Right. Coming to mind, so college, so. town, yeah. um, population, those sorts of things. So we do have that information, and I know our consultants work with those um, cities in mind when we're looking at where do we stand kind of on that national benchmark for similar cities. If you don't mind, right. it, it helps me to look at it and see it, and it helps me get ideals. Do you mind if we got some of that? If I, I don't know if the author council knows, but I would like to see you know where we kind of stand towards cities that actually look like us or or, or you know college towns or just how our population and demographics are so i can see how we're we actually an executive good. summary of that report yes it would be yes. easy to excerpt that straight yeah. out of the matrix report because they benchmarked us the benchmark like us against three other um like cities <coughs> yeah, like to do that. yeah that would be a very interesting <coughs> thank you thank you uh vice mayor adams Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. A uh, couple things. Uh, I think it's a great idea about uh, benchmarking with other uh, university cities uh, in the country and to get it as many as possible as close to the population as it is. But I, I want to uh, bring up again, I think we do need to know what our other cities are doing surrounding us, because just like with the homeless situation, um, I feel like we're bearing the brunt of that uh, in the east side of the this the valley and I I think the affordable housing I want to have a good balance between affordable housing and uh, market rate 
housing. And um, of course, I know we can do more and I support of more affordable housing. I just, I just want to make sure that we, that our, our communities around us are doing their share. And I, I have a feeling they're not. And I guess if we can get those numbers uh, from MAG, that would be helpful. And, and try to push on the other cities. Hey, we, you know, we're doing this, but we need you to do it too. And so we're not just trying to go alone at this um, monumentous, monumentous task. So that's, that's um, where I am uh, on it. I should say monumental task. Yeah, I'm corrected. I'm correcting myself. Uh, but uh, anyway, that's, that's where I am uh, on it. And, and I think we need to just keep on uh, working on affordable housing. We're staying creative. I think we're doing a great job with it. Um, I know that there's some other areas that uh, um, have come to light that we can't discuss at this meeting, but uh, for affordable housing. And I just want to keep on moving forward with it, but get other get other people people on the on our same page and and have some help. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for your time. Thank you, Vice Mayor. One quick thing, and I'm going to go to Council Member Garland. I, I think the council. This is a really good conversation, and one of the things that I'm hearing a lot of is I think something we're hearing very much uh, with conversations about the proposed general plan 2050. It's one of the themes that's coming up, and I think the Vice Mayor and Council Member Navarro touched on it very much. So. I think people understand that we need more affordable housing and housing in all different income categories. But I think part of their frustration is when they hear about the shortage of units throughout the valley, they see the city of Tempe as doing a lot in all of these areas, but they many times look at these surrounding cities and say, what are they actually doing? So then when they see things about changing densities uh, in the city of Tempe or just proposed change densities, the frustration becomes, I understand that we have to do our part, but we can't build all of the housing for every community that surrounds us. We need all of the other cities that are directly adjacent to chip in and also be providing housing in the affordable workforce and market rate categories. And the frustration sometimes is they don't see that happening. It's very hard to push them, but I mean, but to Councilmember Hodge's point, I think that in some of these places like Maricopa Association of Governments, I think we could continue to bring that up to say, look, in Tempe, we're doing our part. We're green lighting all types of new affordable housing and market rate apartments and things of that nature. But it really is incumbent upon all of the cities in the East Valley and throughout the Valley entirely to make sure that they're doing their part and not just simply saying, we know there's a housing crisis, but we refuse to build a single new unit or we refuse to rezone anything from commercial to mixed use to bring in more housing. So I, I, I love the conversation here because this is very, it mirrors a lot of what I'm hearing in the community. They know the city of Tempe, the council, the staff are doing the right thing, but I think their biggest frustration is they sometimes feel like we're almost having to do too much to make up for other cities' deficits because they're not doing nearly enough. So that's where we're going. I, I, that's a really good point. So I sit on the local jurisdiction committee, I'm a co-chair there, and I was trying to bring the point about homelessness specifically to the group that we have, 38 other cities in there, and just trying to say, we, Phoenix and Tempe can't do it all. We need the other cities to open up and help out. So the same thing about affordable housing, it, did, it didn't go very, very well, I'm telling you. There's nobody raised their hand and said they'll help out. Um, but, um, I'll, yeah, anyway. um, but so my question is, so we did this housing inventory just in 2021, just last, 2022, I'm sorry, just last year. Um, and in there, I think the presentation that you guys gave us, there was a PowerPoint that talked, that had listed other cities and how we compare. Would it be possible to resend that to us so that because that already had a lot of the, the information, information that we've been talking about it was in that presentation and then the the affordable how the housing study was also had a great executive report in the front of it on what our housing stock is and what it was important. So maybe if that's possible, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. The only thing I want to mention and caution that report and inventory was based on those original goals. So do you remember when we we went back and the charge for the consultant was to look at our original distribution oh, of 54 yeah, yeah, yeah. so so excuse keep that in mind when you're looking at okay. the report because that's what Irma and I have talked about after the lens by which you're looking at it is with the expectation that the goal was set that that was vision for the city you all can do so then so then the, the, does the report still then state and we still so <coughs> still High in luxury and low and affordable. Is that is that that, that change yeah. identified gaps? So oh okay. Yeah. Oh, that's so good to know. Okay. What is how did it shift? I'm curious. Okay. Okay. 
Well, well it shifted. We had more workforce, so it said we were in the green for workforce, like you don't need any more workforce, mm -hmm. that we were deficit in the affordable and the market rate right. for luxury. Correct. Mm -hmm. So that is why the zero to 80 AMI was identified through mm -hmm. the board and some of our RFPs for affordable housing okay. to help with that balance. But one of the things we discussed is they really looked at it from the established goals that were identified in 2017. Correct. What I'm hearing here, Mayor and Council, is that you might want to revisit those. Reconsider those. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Board Member Drum. Um, yeah, a lot of the, my question was answered about let's not be a magnet for other cities in the valley. You know, it's nice to be the beacon, but you don't want to be the destination. Um, I know in the Housing Choice Voucher Program that there is high priority given to people that already work in Tempe, their favorite in being able to get Housing Choice Vouchers. Is there uh, some sort of uh, metric like that for people that want to live in Tempe but work in Scottsdale? Or is it, would they not? so well here is that probably would ask Irma that question I guess um director Drummond I don't really think I understand your question um we have a limited amount of affordable units uh when someone may, uh, makes an application are you talking about the units specific to the housing choice voucher program no, no or affordable the, units throughout the city just the affordable the, uh, I, housing choice was like Right. So sorry, sorry. I do not think that there is any possible way to execute a rule where a preference would be given to someone who works in Tempe but or works in Scottsdale but lives in Tempe or the other way around. I don't think you can tell landowners to prefer. Oh, that's true. It's not a problem. Yeah. So kind of the same lines. I mean, is there a possibility of a program that could be started for people that are working in Tempe that want to live nearby where they work at? So it's affordable, kind of like a combination to where it's working with their employer to help with those resources, working with the city to find those resources for that affordability. To kind of that's where I, I think. When we talk about this whole thing, people want to work and live in Tempe. People want to work and live in Tempe. Well, if I look at the data, I've guaranteed people are not working and living in Tempe. They're doing one or the other. And so how do we make that true? You know what I'm saying? How can we actually make that true to where we're doing what we're saying we're doing? Um, we're not just putting it out there probably as something to think about because if there's must be a way I think about a, a hotel. An Omni Hotel. They have workers there. Would is there something working with Omni to work with the city to find locations for those workers that might choose to live in Tempe? Um, I don't know. And here's the other thing: Can we separate college from actual work? You know, people that are trying to provide an income, because too much we get college students that take advantage of affordability. So that's really the the kind of the damnedest thing, you know, is we got this real wonkiness of, yeah, the college students are are not, you know, they're they're low income, they're not making any money at all. They qualify for X, Y, and Z. How do how do we carve that out? <laughs> I was going to ask a question with regards to picture. I totally understand. Are are you talking about um, the creation of additional affordable and attainable units, or are you talking about more or less working? with the Omni or other corporations to identify existing resources that are in the city. Yeah, it'd, it'd be like if I had a worker at the Omni that I knew that probably not going to college or working for the family, but they need a place, you know, more sent, more close to work with. How do we get them to work with the city to identify those people so that we can find that group of class, that affordability that makes it convenient for them to work where they're at? It, it, I, I kind of leave it on the table. Like, oh, there seems like we're we're not telling this. We're, we're saying the story, but we're not really telling this story the way we should be telling the story. That we're actually hitting a certain group of people 
and we're doing what we're saying we're doing when we talk about affordability staying in Tippy Woodlands. Can I follow up before you say something? Because I'll tell you what we're doing in the school districts. The school districts are working on that same situation because teachers say it all the time that they can't work and they can't live in the city that they teach in every day. And I know the mayor's had meetings and I've had meetings with them trying to find ways of bringing our teachers um, a way <clears> back in so they can actually afford to live in this city as well as teach in this city too. Right, exactly. So it's those types of programs, mm -hmm. workforce, low income, whatever it is, mm -hmm. But we're really identifying the people that are really working, really doing it, and we're trying to provide for them. So um, with regard to what, what is strange, and I, and I don't know how to reconcile this other than to say it's a shortage of units, but when you look at our housing inventory, as a city manager and Chelsea mentioned, we have an abundance of what we categorize as workforce housing. So that's housing that's coming in at the 80% to 120% of area median income. And that is specifically geared towards teachers, emergency responders, essential workers. So we have an overabundance of the city of Tempe in that type of housing, yet I'm understanding you to share that they are not finding units in the one category that we have an overabundance in. What, okay, let me ask you this. How are we getting that information out? Are you, how is it, is the fire department getting, hey guys, because I'm not seeing it in the fire department when the recruits come in, where are you living at? How can we help you with housing in this area? How are we getting that out? Okay, how are we getting it out to the teachers? You want to live here, we got a program that if you work with the city, we'll try to find you places. You see what I'm saying? I do. Um, Member Navarro, and I believe so. When it comes to workforce housing, the city is not, we are not administering housing for that particular AMI. We're more focused on the affordable because nobody's delivering on the affordable. Yeah, right, right, right. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll keep that separate. Same with affordable, though. How do we work with the, with the workers to try to identify I, those people that are working in Tempe that want to live in Tempe? to where they might get first priority versus someone that's coming in from another place because of the board. That's why I'm trying to pick through. Bear in mind though, a majority of the owners for affordable it. units, however, are private owners. And mm -hmm. so there's no, we can't dictate to them who it is that they end up, end up leasing to. Because well, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, the, the AJ side we bought. Um, that we are going to put the units in there. Right. We have control of that. That's what I'm thinking. That's our opportunity. Where I know it's not going to go to a college student. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I I, I was going to say I completely Councilor Navarro <coughs> nail on the head. But I, I mean I think that is the that is the real reason for the hometown for all program in the first place is is that if we actually are the ones that control the land, we can then make more determinations. It's a lot harder when you're sort of debating with a private sector partner who might need more return on investment to actually make a project work than when you're just simply a city and there's not a profit motive and all you're trying to do is create the kind of diversity that you want to have in all of these different income categories. So right, in that situation with the Apache Central project, where we put out the RFP saying that we wanted up to 400 units of mixed income housing and at least 50% had to be within that zero to 80% AMI that Rosa talked about. I think that's that's also I know what we were trying to do with the Tempe Performing Arts Center building as well was that that building is right smack dab in the middle of the downtown. It was the Tempe Center for the Arts before we had a TCA. And the biggest thing when I would talk to the hotel general managers in the downtown, we obviously now have the Omni, the Canopy, the West and the Mission Palms. They would all say we, we can hire employees, but we can't keep people here. The retention is very difficult because a lot of them are driving in from the West Valley. 45 minutes to an hour each way, gas prices are around $5 a gallon. And the second someone offers these folks two or three more dollars an hour, they're gone. And so if there's some way to create more attainable housing in and around the downtown, that would not only help us hire people, but would actually help us keep people. And I think about the people waiting tables and bartending in the downtown, the people who are doing the housekeeping, the cooking, and a lot of the hotels. I think that's why, to Councilor Navarro's point, the more that we actually own some of these properties and then we can dictate what goes into an RFP, then we're not debating with someone who has more of a profit motive. We're just doing what we think is the right thing and actually trying to fulfill a need. Councilor No, I have a lot of different comments. I'm just reminding you. 
Um, then maybe it's something the, the, that we could do as board. Um, because I forgot. <laughs> I took a client who was trying to find workforce housing, right? And then couldn't find anybody, like they have units and couldn't find anybody to go in it. And they went to ASU and then I sent it to you guys. But maybe there's a way that we as a board can kind of either work with the chamber or somebody and, you know, kind of like College mm -hmm. Connect. Because I'm just thinking, like, exactly. I'm just going to use a different word. But like College Connect, like we'll find some way to connect these people to some, if we have an excess of housing, yeah. why don't we try to figure out some sort of thing and maybe it's housed with the, I mean, I'm not trying to get so we'll help. Um. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I, get it, and I feel you over there too, because I'm not trying to create more work with it, but it's to that point, you're, you're actually spot on. It's working with the chambers. It's like, we got this program. If you have people that can fit in this program, please you. Or they need units. Like we can think like Mary, like Joel, who's trying to find units. He has units. He has nowhere to go. He's like, what is he? And he's told him to go someplace else. And like then I told him to go here and I told him to go away. And then, you know, and so he's wandering around town trying to find Try, because he has a very specific niche of people and he is trying to provide for yeah. housing. And so we could find some sort of, or we could think through it as a database or just some sort of just place that we could send people, we could maybe hook people up, you know, and, and it's, and it maybe it's nothing more than a bulletin board, but it's something to like connect people who are trying to do one thing or the other if we have access. That's what we're doing. Council Thank you, Mayor. Irma, are you already working on incentives to work with landlords? <laughs> And just isn't that on your plate? Good, good. Couldn't that we roll thing. that in and pull in the chamber, let's say, and have businesses, right? If I were a landlord, if I owned something, I would want a steady stream of customers, uh, tenants that had gainful employment that could be consistent. So isn't that what you're already working on? What they're saying are great ideas, but I think it's already on your plate. Wow. You, no, 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 no. But I mean, this would help, right? Am I, this is not new. I've heard this before from <laughs> you all that this is, you're trying to come up with incentives for landlords. Councilmember Chen, that is in fact correct. Our focus um, in the landlord engagement programming, however, is in getting our voucher yeah. participants yeah. Mm -hmm. into housing, which year after year after year becomes mm -hmm. far more complicated and difficult than you can imagine. Even with, um, you know, having guaranteed rent paid on their behalf and, and security deposits paid by the city and some level of, of guarantees that who is going to be living in their unit isn't going to set it on fire and then disappear into the ether and not be able to recoup, it, recoup anything back. So we're already with this small, small subset of 10 PMs trying to figure out um, how to open up housing options for them. So yes, but conversely, I think what, what you shared, Angela, is a great idea, something that, um, we could work on something together. Yeah, absolutely. And we have Christopher back here who's, um, you know, brought on to lead landlord engagement. And um, while I had a far more uh, narrow view of what he would be participating in, I think these are fabulous ideas. Yes, Councilor So um, we had a landlord symposium a couple of years ago, I think it was, um, where we did a lot of publicizing to people, potential landlords, and people who are already landlords and working in the voucher program. Found a gentleman that was loves working with our voucher program. He was so incredibly nice, and we did a little video and stuff with him. But when we had the symposium, we had we had more staff there than we had landlords. Come. And it was really, it was really unfortunate because you know there's so many landlords out there, and it was publicized for a long time. So I'm glad you're here, and that's one thing you're going to do, because we had such great information and such great help there. Home Inc. I think was there. Was Home Inc. The one the insurance people. I believe yeah. Christopher was there as well. Yeah, it was incredible, but we, we just didn't get the landlords. We need to, we need to help the landlords find us. We need to become landlords a lot more too. <laughs> yeah. Talk to you. Okay, so just a couple of things, um, Irma, and, and looking at this, I'm sorry, we're, we're president. 
um, and looking at this in terms of we know how many units we have, we know what the um, affordable rates are, we know where the housing, but do we know the vacancy rates and what the duration is of those vacancies? Because then that helps us to understand, I think, a little bit more around, well, if we've got this many people who want to live in Tempe, then because what happens is people will compete for these units. I mean, just realistically, um, if you are a renter in the city and it's affordable for you, um, whether it's market rate or deemed um, workforce or affordable, then sometimes you're competing to get into a unit as well. So do we have that information? Um, is that available? Director Harris, um, absolutely the information is available. I do not have it here with me today. So I do it for you with regard to vacancy rate. I can't tell you the entire Valley reports low vacancy rate. And Christopher, do you happen to know for the Valley what the vacancy rate might be? I don't. Okay. It would, we will follow up, but um, it is well known that our vacancy rates are very, very low. Uh, because we have a, a severe shortage of units, of housing in general. Anyone else? You, you all were talking about how you interface with uh, uh, prospective uh, renters or people that lease and rent out their buildings. Um, I, I've said before, they take a look at, at the affordable uh, at the at the excuse me as the voucher uh, section eight people as if everybody came from Cabrini Green and they're going to tear the place up and I I use one of those vouchers and I've been uh, ten years where I'm at and and able to stay despite that uh, rent uh, gouging that's happened in the last couple of years and able to remain. Um, there's there's some education that should be mm -hmm. given to the property owners um, that like during COVID uh, a lot a lot of people didn't pay their rent because they had a, a moratorium on uh, evictions but that wasn't the case for people that were on section 8 for instance they all got paid but if you ask the uh, the view of landlords in Tempe, there, there, I know that there are fewer and fewer uh, renting yeah. to that because mm -hmm. they think they're going to tear the place up. Yep. They're going to bring the cops, jump cars in the park. Yep, park. I know because I was on Section Eight, so I know what you're talking about. They have a, a it's a, it's a mind, it's a narrow mind frame when they see it. They hear Section Eight, they hear the worst. They hear people who are going to have a hundred kids and having parties every weekend and yes it, it, they need to change that narrative we do. When, I, when I know one of the things that I know we're working on kind of that the cities of Tucson and Phoenix have also done is kind of talking about enacting a source of income discrimination ordinance yeah. in the city of Tempe so landlords cannot refuse someone who has a housing choice voucher because yeah. they there's some kind of stigma or stereotype I mean, yes. and that's what that's meant to do if you have a voucher and i have the ability to pay you cannot turn me away because yeah. i don't want you know you here yeah. so yeah. so yeah i know that's something that her and her team are working oh, on i right love now. that i believe we'll be presenting on that next week this it would be this thursday or is it thursday, thursday? is it this thursday yeah, yeah. we have one. Oh, okay this thursday. <laughs> 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 this week. I'll be there. I'll, I'll be somewhere. Just saying. So, I'm not going to be there. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Anyone else? All right. Well, thank you so much. Great conversation as always. Let's move forward here to item number six, City of Tempe Hometown for All process preview, and that's Whitell again. Um, if you don't mind, may I? So I just wanted to know, I'm going to pass it back to Whitell, but I, I wanted to share with you, uh, you know, so Hometown for All uh, had, been had been established when I first got here. It was already alive and well and, and working, and, um, and so, but it was, I was having difficulty really trying to get my arms wrapped around like all of the various factors that go into create this creating of a hometown football process. And so, um, you know, I 
I liken myself to be a little bit on the intelligent side, but I was really, really struggling <laughs> with this. Um, and thankfully, um, the city manager in Chelsea uh, recognized that and assigned Whitell <laughs> to helping me navigate. And, um, and lo and behold, this is far more complicated um, than we ever imagined. And so Whitell and I have been skipping down the yellow brick, brick road with one another, <laughs> learning all things hometown for all. And um, she's gonna talk to you a little bit about what we've learned um, how far we've come and how much more work that we have in front of us, but it's all very, very positive. So, Michael, thank you um, for accompanying me on this journey. And thank you. So, I'll just preface um, this brief uh, update in regards to innovation. It's hard to be first. I mean, Rose and I say that a lot. Um, Hometown for All was created by the mayor, approved by the council in 2021. And really, you have to create that roadmap, so I'll build upon your yellow brick road thing. And with that means there's a lot of twists and turns that come up when you're working from, with the city, with nonprofits, with multiple stakeholder groups, boards, um, stakeholders. So this has been really a process of discovery. And I'd like to thank Majla and Councilmember Chen. They have been great at letting us pick their brains from a Majla standpoint in regards to her work. Um, the other hats that, that they wear, and then Councilmember Chen's hat also in, in regards to fundraising. And so, what we've discovered, you know, I'll just remind you as the Hometown for All really, it's about city investments and it's really about funding. And so, we know that 50% of certain permit fees go into the Hometown for All fund, and then the other uh, funds are raised through pledges that relies into donations that would then be um, given directly to the affiliate. And so, even that unique piece of funding gets a little complex when you start to look at the details. But really, um, what we have discovered is that we want to have a more strategic approach with the Hometown for All Fund, um, moving from kind of an ad hoc approach, that um, shifting to a fundraising mindset, which we, which is a little bit different. Um, I'm, I grew up in government, so I'm still in government, and so having a fundraising mindset and approach is a little bit different than just sharing information about a great opportunity to people who might want to pledge. And so with that comes um, some key communication points. Um, specifically, we've done a bit of an exercise of different roles that every um, group like yourselves play, as well as our staff, and making sure that we're avoiding conflicts of interest. And so we found some ideal communication points around that. But we also found some opportunities and unrealized opportunities for markers and some uh, for marketing. Some would be with brokers and architects. We also know that there's some process that is a need for intentional handoffs. Um, donor management is a relationship. It is not just a transactional activity. And so that sort of relationship has to be nurtured and it has to be discovered at the right time and, um, and, and, and maintained along its life cycle. So we know that there's some work to be done there. And then also Irma and her team, um, standard operating procedures for a lot of this, whether it be from timeliness of invoicing to uh, appreciation and, and recognition of donors. And how do we do all of that from not only a city standpoint, but most importantly then at that point from the affiliate standpoint. And the merging and separation of roles is also what we've had a, a lot of discovery about here. And I, I see uh, Teresa shaking her head because there is a big difference when you start to put all these different parties together to have a one common purpose, which is affordable housing in Tempe, but we all come at it from our different angles. And so like, um, like affordable housing, Hometown for All has a lot of complexity to it. And we've been trying to peel the onion and separate in order to understand where we have the best leverage points and not miss any opportunities that are inherent in hometown for all. And so that is where we're at um, with this process and it's involved staffing. I'm so glad that um, Tanya Chavez has been able to schedule us um, on a weekly basis to kind of get our heads together and really purposefully work on this and kind of put all the pieces in place. That includes our community development team, it includes our housing team, our affiliate, <laughs> Permit keeps changing hats every time economic we meet. Development. <laughs> yes, economic development. Um, so I'm just really appreciative that this has really been a discovery, but we're really going to be strategic about how we how we approach this. And I always say that hope is a not a strategy. So we're coming up with strategies regarding how do we realize um, a lot of these opportunities for hometown for all and really get that fund 
um, larger, healthier, and you know, committed into housing. Thank you, Waddell. That's Thank my you. cheerleading. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Uh, anyone uh, from the board, council, any comments or questions? Thank Council you. Gamar, Big Council Yeah, no, first of all, I just want to say I appreciate you guys and all the work you guys have done. I mean, it really is magnificent. I mean, seriously, where we're at today in, in terms of housing and how we're applying what we say we're going to do. I mean, you guys have done a great job on taking this. I know that we sit here and spin ideas at the me, especially at the last minute. But I think it's it's some of those things that we get bombarded on that we want to make sure that we're doing and we're pushing and we're achieving a little bit more. It's not being satisfied where we're at, so to speak. But at the same time, I want to recognize that you guys have really done a tremendous job in just manifesting this whole thing. So I appreciate everything that's going on. Thank you, Councilor Carl. I was going to say the same thing. I think it's great what you're doing. I love when I saw this slide in our packet. I'm like, oh, strategic. Yes. Oh, <laughs> procedures. Yes. So thank you so much for what you're doing because we we need this, and the only way to make it better is to, to go through this. And so thank you so much, and thank you, Councilor Chen and Board Member, <laughs> for being able to help about it. Uh, Councilor Rock. I just want to echo. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Great Seeing job, none. everyone. Oh, thank you, Vice Mayor. <laughs> You're welcome. All right. Well, seeing none, if there's no other further comments or questions, that brings us to item number seven, which is adjournment. Just wanted to thank everyone for spending their Tuesday evening with us, and thank you for all the great work, really great conversation. We look forward to keeping moving forward together. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're adjourned. Thank you. 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 Thank you.